nine o'clock. I'm live in Jerusalem after a week that could transform the Middle East. Tonight on a special edition of The World with me, Yalda Hekim. Israel strikes back, launching an attack on Iranian soil, targeting a province with nuclear research facilities. Inside Iran, worshippers chanted death to Israel after Friday prayers. And from Lebanon, Hezbollah warns that all of Iran's proxies could band together to fight Israel. We have every right to be together in fighting the same enemy who keep aggressing and occupying and slaughtering and making genocides in our region. A lot has changed, but nothing has changed. Tonight, we'll assess Iran's muted response and ask what happens next. That's all coming up in the next 60 minutes. Good evening and welcome to The World with me, Yalda Hakim, live from Jerusalem. We knew it was coming and in the end, it took nearly six days for Israel to hit back against Iran. Let's just start with what we know. Well, you'll remember that things began to ramp up two and a half weeks ago when an Israeli strike on Iran's consulate in Damascus killed 13 people, including two senior Revolutionary Guard commanders. Iran retaliated on Saturday, launching 300 drones and missiles towards Israel, forcing residents in the Golan Heights and southern Israel to take cover. 99% of the missiles were shot down before entering Israeli airspace. And then overnight, Israel responded. Iranian state TV says three drones were destroyed over the central city of Isfahan, close to a major airbase and nuclear facilities. And in what could be an attempt at de-escalation, Israel hasn't confirmed the strike and Iran has indicated it won't retaliate immediately. So is this the end of the hostilities? We'll discuss that in a moment. But let's get started with this report from our Middle East correspondent, Alastair Bank. After five days considering its next move, Israel launched an attack on Iran in the early hours of Friday morning. The target was an airbase near the central city of Isfahan. My first light, the skies were calm again. This was filmed at the nearby Isfahan nuclear facility. Not itself a target, but by hitting close by, Israel had made a point. By breakfast time, Iranian state media was reporting that a few small drones had been shot down. Nothing has happened. Everything is back to normal. The sound heard early in the morning today in Esfahan was not an explosion. It was our powerful air defense firing at a suspicious object. Social media in Iran mocked Israel's attack, another indication that the government was starting to play it down. Iran's president gave an address on television later in the morning and only had this to say on recent tensions with Israel. Striking Israel was necessary, obligatory, unifying and a source of pride and power for our great country. There has been no official comment from the Israeli government, although the far-right National Security Minister Ben Gavir put out this tweet describing the strikes as feeble. Israel's allies, who this week had been urging restraint, were noticeably coy today. I'm not going to speak to that, except to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Calm heads should prevail. Any significant escalation in the region is not what anyone needs. It wouldn't be in anyone's interests. There have been no reports of casualties from the Israeli attack, and Iran state TV hasn't shown any video of damage caused. Benjamin Netanyahu would have been given a menu of options for a response against Iran by the IDF. On the more provocative end of the scale would have been a strike against Iran's nuclear facilities. Lower down, an attack on pro-Iranian militia in Syria, for example. In one ear, he would have had the extreme right-wing elements of his coalition demanding that Israel take out a strong response. In the other ear, the US president and other Western allies telling him to take the win and walk away. In the end, he sided with neither and chose something in the middle, a limited response, which Iran appears to be brushing off. Alistair Bunkel, Sky News in Jerusalem. 
Well, it's likely that Israel's attack was carefully calibrated to send a signal that it is capable of striking Iranian territory, but without actually causing any damage. Isfahan province hosts several military sites and nuclear facilities. Here's our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, on why it was an ideal target. A muted response by Israel and Iran to this apparent Israeli attack seems to indicate that neither side is seeking an escalation to all-out war, for now. While the region is still on a knife edge, the crisis could have been much worse. This map gives a sense of the Iranian military bases and nuclear sites Israel may have considered hitting in retaliation to Iran's unprecedented missile and drone attack last weekend. Yet the response looks to have been limited, focused on the city of Isfahan, a centre of Iranian missile production, research and development. Local media reported explosions caused by Iranian air defences shooting down drones. At least some of the activity appears to have happened at an Air Force base in the city. This picture shows the entrance office windows in the area were reportedly shattered. Satellite imagery from a few years ago gives a sense of why this place might be of interest, with aircraft hangars as well as jets on the tarmac. Also in the area is a facility that's part of Iran's nuclear program. This still from a video shows multiple air defence positions nearby. A local news reporter describes the site as nuclear energy mountain and the place is well guarded. Any attack by Israel would have been a way to test Iranian air defences and to send a message. I think Israel sending a very clear message to Iran that it can target very precisely deep inside Iran. And it's also sending a message at the same time that it is not keen to escalate. It's basically re responding very precisely. While recent fears have been about all-out conflict, Israel and Iran have long been locked in a shadow war of deniable attacks and counter-attacks. An Israeli drone was suspected of a strike back in January last year, also in the central city of Isfahan. Western and regional leaders have spent the past few days urging restraint on both sides. And while a direct war could yet happen, there will surely be renewed hope that further confrontation between Iran and Israel will return to the shadows. Deborah Haynes reporting there, and as Deborah was saying, a collective sigh of relief for now. But the past six days may have changed the rules of the game here in the Middle East. Here's our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn. In protests in Tehran, they chanted down with Israel and stuck to the official script in the wake of Israeli attacks. The Israelis didn't do anything special based off what I heard from news agencies. I don't think they have the courage to do anything after Iran's successful strike. There is relief across the region that Iran is responding by putting on protests, not retaliating again with missiles. The Middle East to step back from the brink after Iran's unprecedented missile onslaught on Israel at the weekend. But analysts here say the rules in the region have changed and Iran has now forever upped the ante. Now, every time that Israel might do something against the IRGC or might do some sabotage against their nuclear program, as we've seen countless times over the years, this could be the excuse that the Iranians want to launch another salvo of drones and ballistic missiles at Israel. For almost half a century of assassinations, proxy wars, secret operations, Iran and Israel have fought each other in the shadows. After Israel's massive airstrike on Iranian commanders in Damascus earlier this month, the fear was of all-out conflict engulfing the region. That hasn't happened yet. But Israeli observers of Iran say something fundamental has now shifted all the same. Yes, the shadow war came out of the shadows. It will return to the shadows, but this is, this is, not, uh, this is not permanent. Now we have a precedent for Iran firing at Israel in such large numbers. I think they could do it again somewhere along the line, but uh, I think they're going to choose a more, more convenient time. Israel still faces the threat of attacks from Hezbollah from the north, missiles from militia in the east, and its war in Gaza has yet to neutralise Hamas. 
on any of those fronts, there is the risk of escalation to a much bigger war. That threat has been averted for now with Iran, but it remains an ever-present danger. And Dom joins me live here in Jerusalem. Dom, there is no doubt that Israel was sending a very clear signal to Iran. Yeah, but it's hard to read exactly what that message was, given that we don't really know exactly what they hit, what they intended to hit. Originally, we thought they looked as though they were trying to hit an airbase near um, Isfahan, and we were wondering whether it was a kind of airbase for an airbase, eye for an eye kind of hit, because they hit, did manage to reach an airbase, uh, one of the few targets they did hit. On Saturday, were the Israelis trying to make the point um, back in, in reverse? Then uh, we've heard from ABC colleagues in America saying that they've been told by you officials that the target was the radar defence system around the Natanz nuclear uh, facility. Now, that is a very deep uh, bunker in which uh, Iran is enriching uranium, a key part of its alleged nuclear weapons programme. So you wonder whether actually Israel was trying to send a message to the Iranians uh, that way, saying that we can strip this sensitive location of all protection if we need to. And also the reports tonight are that it wasn't a missile. It might have been missiles as well as fighter jets launching missiles from just outside Iranian airspace. So the message could also be to the Iranians um, that we can hit you just outside your airspace and do damage if we want to. That may be reading too much into this. There are those in the Israeli media saying actually this wasn't thought through, as in the same way the attack on the embassy in Damascus uh, on April the 1st that precipitated all this, that led to Iran's counter strike, wasn't thought through either. This is more Netanyahu uh, sort of thinking on the hoof and um, not really thinking through exactly what he was doing with this and the Israeli military uh, following suit. Um, so there is controversy on that wing of Israeli politics. Others saying this wasn't nearly enough. Feeble or lame was the one word in Hebrew that Ismail Ben-Gavir, Netanyahu, whose national security use, uh, minister used in his reaction to it. Astonishing, uh, really, his reaction uh, to this. So there's a wide range of reactions to what happened. We can only guess at what the message was. I think the key thing is that now time, some time has elapsed. It doesn't look like there's any follow through from the Israelis and the Iranians are clearly trying to move on from this. And so the real jeopardy, moment of jeopardy about the region being plunged into an all-out conflict does seem to have passed for now, certainly in terms of an Israel-Iranian war. Yeah, as you say, for now, we will be getting more of your analysis throughout the programme. But for now, Dom, thank you so much. Well, let's just uh, bring in Tohid Asadi, a professor at the University of Tehran. Mr. Asadi, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on the program. Just give us a sense of the reaction of what's happened uh, since early hours of this morning when we learned uh, that uh, Israel had uh, uh, launched an, a strike on Iran. Uh, well, actually, Israel had reportedly warned the Biden administration earlier, earlier on Thursday that they will have sort of attack in the next 24 or 48 hours. So there was this expectation inside Iran, whether this, these events, the attacks reportedly uh, on Iran or the responses Israelis have been talking about, I think it's a little bit early to say at all events. Uh, the situation currently speaking looks quite calm, no sign of explosion or injury, and IAEA just confirmed that there is no damage to Iran's nuclear sites. The official reports also indicated that there is no record of any target getting hit. It's quite opposite to what I have been hearing from the Israeli or the mainstream Western media, and I see a clear uh, sort of exaggerated coverage in the Western media uh, and of course, added to that is the very complicated nature of the situation. Uh, we know that this Iran's recent retaliatory attacks sent a clear message that there is going to be zero tolerance uh, pertaining to any hostile attack by Israelis against Iran. So I think the Zionist regime is trying to. Do you think to that message? Do you think that message was received? Uh, because as far as the Israelis, and we've spoken to Israeli officials, the Americans, when you speak to uh, the British and the French, they all described the operation last week, the attack that Iran launched on Israel, as a success. Uh, because they said 99% of those missiles, those dr drones, were, were struck down before they even reached uh, Israeli airspace. Uh, well, this uh, number of 99% or the 50-17% that Iran reports is quite controversial. But it's not a matter of playing with numbers. It's a matter of the legitimate act of defense that uh, I, th I think created sort of 
irreversible reality and Israelis should be adjusting themselves to these new realities on the ground. We know that Iran is not currently speaking at all interested in further escalation for Tehran as far as they have been saying the, the entire retaliatory uh, strike is over. But at the same time, I think Israelis have received this clear message that the previous strike against their soil was quite limited. Next is not going to be that much limited. It's going to be extended. Iran decided not to use its full missile capacity. Next will be different. And Iran, it took, of course, nearly 13 days for Iran to respond. But next time, Iran is saying that the response is going to immediate. And last point is that with this Recent well, well, actually, uh, actually, Ibrahim Raisi, Ibrahim Raisi, the, the president, said even if, yes, just yesterday, he said even if we see the tiniest attack launched on us, we will send a very clear message that will be stronger than what we saw last weekend. What we've seen throughout the day is state media, officials really playing this down. Some saying it didn't happen, others saying that uh, the air defences kicked in and, and uh, some drones were, were struck down. Um, so, you know, this is also um, the, the, the bluster that we heard over the last 24 hours. Uh, Iranian officials are now really trying to downplay this entire episode. Uh, well, I don't think so, because uh, the nature of the recent attack, if it's an attack, it looks a little, little bit controversial. Reportedly, uh, it was said that even there is this uh, this possibility of drones uh, coming from inside Iran, which is which is an, a new scenario. Uh, now, of course, I'm strongly convinced that currently Iran is just assessing the situation and assessing the attack and assessing its response. Uh, of course, so far, Iran ha has shown that it's playing it in a very smart way. It, it doesn't just rush into quick responses, which would jeopardize the national interests of the country. And of course, we know, we know, and we take it for granted that the risk of miscalculation under such circumstance is very high. Let me just put emphasis, Iran is not interested in dragging entire West Asia uh, into a full-fledged all-out war scenario. That's why they're trying to practice... Yes, and, and, and we have... We have heard, uh, you know, the Iranians make it quite clear that they, at this stage, have made it quite clear to the Americans and the Americans back to the Iranians that they are not uh, interested in all-out war. Um, Mr. Asadi, thank you very much for your time. That was Tohid uh, Asadi, a, a professor at the University of Tehran, speaking to me there. Let's bring in Dom back to get some of his analysis on this. I mean, quite uh, extraordinary, isn't it? The perception from Iran versus the perception here. Uh, President Biden told Prime Minister Netanyahu, see it as a win. It was successful. Nothing was really hit. You know, they launched 300 missiles and drones. We didn't see the impact of that. From the Iranian side, they say that they sent a clear message. It was a successful operation. Next time, it could be much worse. Yeah, and um, so that uh, American exhortation to take the win was sort of thrown into the crucible of Israeli politics, uh, where it was found wanting because the Israelis wanted to see some kind of retaliatory action that would punish the Iranians. Their concern is that the Iranians, having done this once, they will do so again. And so Netanyahu said, no, I've got to strike back, uh, but seems to have reassured the Americans it was going to be limited. That's what we were told before the strike, and it does seem to have been a fairly limited, calibrated um, attack. Uh, what we're hearing there from the Iranians, though, I think will concern the Israelis and their Western allies. And we heard it also before the uh, strike happened, the, the counter-strike from the uh, Israelis, and that is that whatever um, happens now, um, that red line has been crossed by the Iranians. And if they are hit, if there is an IRGC assassination uh, in Syria, if a nuclear scientist gets killed uh, in Iran, uh, if centrifuges start spinning out of control uh, inexplicably, then they might respond to that with a repeat of what happened on Saturday. And I think the big question for, for Israelis is, there's that one concern, that that taboo's gone, so it makes it undoubtedly more likely that Iran would launch more direct uh, attacks on, on Israel. But I think the other concern is that on Saturday, we had Americans in the command and control centre here. We had 12 days of warning. We had the British, the French, the Arab uh, allies of Israel all arrayed waiting for this. The concern for the Israelis is if they do something that the Iranians d d decide warrants direct retaliation, and they do so quickly, will Israel be as well defended? So I think on the eve of Passover, there is real unease about what happens, even though the region has swerved the bullet in terms of a much bigger conflict. Well, as you say, I mean, it does feel on some levels that 
that a crisis has been averted. But as you say, it sort of feels like a new phase, a new precedence has been set that the Israelis have been a little bit shaken by. Yes, and, and to some extent, um, there, are, there are those on the right of Israeli politics, politics saying the Netanyahu government has kind of brought it upon itself. Because when it attacked that embassy compound in Damascus on April the 1st, it was going for a number of IRGC commanders who they believe were trying to uh, replicate in Syria what uh, they have done very effectively with Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. So that was going to be very much a threat to Israel. Therefore, they felt they had to neutralise it. But by choosing a diplomatic facility, they, uh, we understand now from various reports, did not expect the kind of reaction they got from the Iranians. They thought they'd get a kind of repeat of what they saw when they went for other targets outside of diplomatic facilities. So that was an intelligence failure, uh, not anticipating the Iranian uh, response. Uh, and that repeats, in a sense, what happened on October the 7th, when they did not anticipate what Hamas did to the south. And I think that's another cause of great concern for Israelis, that the Israelis are very good at intelligence gathering. They seem to have kind of lost the plot, in a sense, in terms of reading intelligence, interpreting from it and anticipating what the enemy is going to do. And that, I think, is a fundamental issue for the Israelis, which is worrying many people here as well. Yeah, indeed. I spoke to two uh, former prime ministers who described it as two strategic blunders, what you uh, just described there, Dom. Thank you so much. And we will be speaking to Dom a little later on in the programme. You're watching a special edition of The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Stay with me, uh, because coming up, uh, we'll be live in Lebanon to hear a warning from one of Iran's proxies, Hezbollah, they say they're prepared for war. Well, obviously, what the first of all, I'd like to address that the government just made an announcement, and this announcement is eliminating golden visa for those who want to purchase a property for 500,000 euros or more. But the, rem the golden visa remains active till now because there should be a parliament process for the amendment that they're going to do to the act. There may be changes or there may be not. So for now, it's still active. We don't know, this is creating a lot of uh, disinformation because we don't know what's gonna happen to the current holders of golden visas which is actually a residency permit. We are not aware what's going to happen when the residency permit expires and they're about to do a renewal. And we are not. We are, there is also uncertainty for those who are currently processing their, their, their golden visa. Well, in my professional opinion, they should continue, okay? Because uh, until uh, we don't learn anything more about this amendment to the law, as I said, is still active and we are currently processing its golden visa and the golden visa department that's located in Madrid which is called Unidad de Grandes Empresas is still processing them okay and that will be my, my, my advice to continue let's say that in a few days we learn that those that are currently holders or they are processing it they, those will be processed but once they end once they expire in the meantime, if you're a currently or a holder of a golden visa, this residency permit, you can actually swap it, okay, to another residency permit while you are here in Spain.
Welcome back to a special edition of The World with me, Yalda Hakim. We'll be hearing from residents in Lebanon in just a moment, but first to a developing story from New York. A man is in critical condition after setting himself on fire outside the court building where Donald Trump's fraud trial is taking place. Conspiracy theory pamphlets were found near the man who has now been identified as Maxwell Azarello. He pulls out a canister and pours some kind of liquid on himself, a liquid we believe is an accelerant, and he lights himself on fire. The male, he takes a couple of steps while he's on fire, and then eventually he falls onto a police barrier and falls down to the ground. He's on fire. Uh, another area in the park where some of the accelerant spilt is also on fire. Civilians, court officers, members of the police department, they run into the park. Uh, they make efforts to put him out. They use their coats. They use fire extinguishers. That's a police uh, conference from a little earlier. Let's go straight to our James Matthews, who joins me from Washington. And James, a, a horrifying situation. Yeah, horrifying indeed for all of those. And there were many who witnessed this. Yalda, we're going to show you pictures of what took place in the park opposite the courtroom in Lower Manhattan. And I do warn viewers that this is uh, distressing imagery. What happened was that Max Azzarello, a 37-year-old from St. Augustine in Florida, traveled to New York. His family were unaware he was here. Uh, he went to the park around the time that inside the court they had just selected the last of 18 jurors, 12 for the jury box and six alternates. Around that time, lunchtime, uh, he went into the park. He had in his possession pamphlets, which he threw in the air. Then he covered himself in an accelerant and lit the flame. There was a fire. It took a minute or two for New York police officers and court staff to get to him using fire extinguishers. They managed to douse the flames. Uh, Mr Azzarello has been taken to hospital, where he's said to be in a critical condition. The police were asked about uh, his behaviour, the content of these pamphlets that he threw in the air, and they said that they were propaganda-based conspiracy theories relating to Ponzi schemes and talking about local educational institutes as fronts for the mob. So the police are saying that the literature that he threw around the park was rooted in conspiracy theory and propaganda. They are looking into his background, his social media posts and his associates and so on. But right now, no direct link necessarily to what was happening inside the court building, Donald Trump's continuing trial, which reached something of a milestone today, Yalda. The jury is in place. They have a jury. It will continue. Uh, it's continuing this afternoon with a number of legal matters. But on Monday, we should see opening statements for the trial to begin proper. James, thank you, uh, as ever, for bringing us up to date there. Let's return now to events in the Middle East. Up until this week, Israel has engaged in battles with Iranian proxy groups, including Hezbollah in Lebanon. Well, Sky News has been hearing from senior officials in the militant group and ordinary people displaced by the conflict. From the Lebanese capital, Beirut, our special correspondent Alex Crawford has sent us this report. The Iranian influence looms large in Lebanon. And Hezbollah is the strongest and most powerful of Iran's proxies. This fighter's funeral was a chance to show not just the Hezbollah strength in numbers, but the loyalty it can call on against the common enemies. And they start this devoted allegiance very young. Those of us in Lebanon and everyone who is part of the axis of the resistance everywhere, we're not going to surrender and no one can frighten us or any partner in this axis. And that is the real risk and the message from Hezbollah and Iran. Hit us and you hit us all. And the axis covers Yemen, Iraq and Syria as well as Lebanon's powerful militia. It's not really known how strong Hezbollah is in terms of numbers of fighters. Some say that there's as many as 150,000 fighters. Impossible to tell. All we can tell is that there are 
a lot of them, and they are growing strong. The bombing on the southern Lebanese Israeli border has intensified over the past few days, and with it, tensions have soared over Israeli military intentions this side of the border. There are already tens of thousands living rough after being forced out of their homes to get out of the line of fire. They can't keep up with demand, and those in need keeps rising. Now, mm. for me, yes, it's war. It's war, war. Uh, in fact, it's war, because daily we, we saw the pump, we listened to the, the voice of the uh, airplanes. Uh, the, it's a very, very hard situation. The Hijazi family, including an elderly grandmother and 11 young children, are sleeping in a classroom now, uncertain about when or what they'll return to. When the phosphorus bombs hit the ground, they produce some sort of yellow powder, and there's a disgusting smell. All our lands are like this. All the south is like this. War is stressful, and in these conditions, it doesn't take much to spark a fight. They've suffered a lot here already, and right now the funerals of fighters are sometimes several times a day. But the Hezbollah hierarchy, as well as the rank and file, seem to be signalling they don't want an all-out war, but they're ready for one. Perhaps the only certainty is that the dangers of an escalation still very much remain, and nothing has removed that so far. Alex Crawford, Sky News in southern Lebanon. So what will Iran's proxies do now? Will the Houthis in Yemen, Hamas groups in Iraq and Syria and Hezbollah in Lebanon are all part of the so-called axis of resistance and support Iran? Well, today, a senior Hezbollah official told Alex the axis would not hesitate to come together to fight Israel. Here's their conversation. So what do you make, though, of this attack in the last 24 hours against Iran? There was an attack against Iran. I've never heard of such a thing. Right. You I don't think heard, there was an I, attack? I, I, heard, I heard it in the news, actually. I mean, but we want to see the results. Uh, it's always estimated that the Israelis, as long as the Western support and Western cover is there, they could attack. It's a possibility. But the Iranians have made it very clear. If they attack, they are going to take the uh, retaliation three or four faults, at least. If they are ready to uh, take the brunt of what they do, then let it be. So it's in their hands. It's in their hands. Right. So you don't think there has been an attack? That's the Iranian if it is, Hezbollah it's, view. My understanding is that the Israelis up till now, they want to save their face. But so far, if this is, do you believe this is a, a retaliation for what happened two days ago? I've got no idea, but I am interested in Hezbollah's view. In, in our, I did say that uh, the Israelis, with the Western support, if they get the green light, they would do it. My understanding that uh, there is still some kind of wisdom at one point that they want to go into a regional war. Nobody has an interest in going into an open confrontation, regional comprehensive war in the region, because this might lead to other things. And again, this is not because the Western side is, uh, has like awakening of humanity or whatever. This is because it, uh, it doesn't boil down to their interest. It doesn't boil down to their interest. Uh, it does not suit their policies. And at the same time, we don't want as well to have a comprehensive confrontation from our side. But if it is imposed, they see, and we will see the kind of results that will unfold. How strong is Hezbollah? How much damage could they do? Hezbollah is strong enough as to make the Israelis make lots of calculations before they go into any kind of open confrontation. And do you feel, does Hezbollah feel, does the Iranian hierarchy feel, that the foundations for potential tipping into war still exist? Or what is, what is the view now? The Iranians, they make their own estimations and evaluations. If things escalated into a larger scale, you have to understand, and everybody has to understand, that just like what the West is doing, all of these governments and armies and countries are supplying Israel, then the Axis will fight as an Axis. And that involves, involves multiple countries and multiple militia groups? When we talk, we, we're talking about resistance. I, you call it militia, I mean, I don't impose on you what to use, but we're talking about freedom fighting fighters. Groups. Yeah, yeah, fighting groups. Freedom fighters who believe it's their land 
It's their dignity. We have the same enemy. We have the same threat. We have the same language. We have the same religion. We have the same values. We have every right to be together in fighting the same enemy who keep aggressing and occupying and slaughtering and making genocides in our region. On that night, more than yeah. 300 drone and missile uh, strikes were attempted. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the Israelis, only 90%, the bulk of them, did not penetrate, did not do any damage. Not a single Israeli was killed, for instance. Yes. Well, do you is, see that as a loss or as, 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 no, as they, to, to they you, view it, a loss it's, for Iran? First of, all, first of all, it's the decision that has been taken. It's the resolve and the determination to hit back. This is one thing. The other thing, the Iranians have to reveal what did they want exactly to do, you know? It's a, did they really want people to be killed or did they want to tell and to send a strong message that we are ready to retaliate? I see it as a kind of victory to Iran, as a kind of victory to, to the whole axis. It's not how many Israelis were killed. When you talk about 300 drones or 200 missiles or whatever, I tell you about uh, four uh, Hiroshima, equal Hiroshima, atomic bomb that have been dropped on Gaza. But there seemed to be a huge escalation on the weekend. This is again a sovereign country that has been attacked by the Israelis. The Israelis who feel that they are on full uh, liberty to do whatever they want because they have the veto power in the Security Council by the United States. They have the support of all of the Western powers. So that's why, I mean, when you talk about 300 drones and escalation, you're talking before, we have to remember the day before that the Israelis targeted uh, the uh, Iranian consulate in Damascus. Alex Crawford uh, with that report. Well, stay with us because it's emerged America was only notified at the last minute. Coming up, we'll assess how effective Israel's actions have been with two retired generals, one from Israel and one from the United States.
Welcome back to the program. Now, we'll hear from a retired Israeli general in a moment. But first, I just want to take you back to New York, where Donald Trump has just been speaking to a reporters after a jury was selected for his criminal trial. Have a listen. OK, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, we just had another hearing. And the trial starts on Monday, which is long before a lot of people thought the judge wants us to, to go as fast as possible. Uh, that's for his reasons, not for my reasons. And this is really a concerted witch hunt. Very simple. Everything you heard in there, this is a witch hunt by numerous judges, Democrat judges. You take a look at it, and Gorin is a whack job. What he did was a disgrace. It's being reviewed by the appellate division. And I hope they do justice, because everybody's looking. And nobody, no business is coming into the city. None whatsoever. They're looking at that case. That case is a threat to democracy, frankly, what took place with the AG. A crooked AG, Letitia James, who campaigned in the fact, who campaigned in the fact that I'm going to get Trump, I'm going to get Trump. That's all she said for two years. Donald Trump uh, speaking there outside the courthouse in New York. And uh, we were also reporting that breaking news in the last hour or so where we got reports that a man had actually set himself out uh, on fire outside uh, the court where Donald Trump's fraud trial is taking place. Now, back to the Middle East, and we're following developments after an Israeli missile attack on Iran. Israel has refused to comment on the reports, while Iran has played down the attack, saying three drones were shot down near the central city of Isfahan. Tehran insists nothing was hit, and it has no plans to retaliate. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Israel's tactics with this attack. I'm joined now by retired Major General Giora Island, the former head of Israel's National Security Council. Thank you so much, General, for joining us here on the program. When we spoke earlier in the week, um, you counseled and cautioned, and you said that the Iran's attack last weekend on, on Israel should be viewed as a success, and Israel shouldn't further escalate the situation. How do you assess uh, what's happened in the last day? Well, I don't think that this is a very significant uh, event. I mean, Israel tried to do something to send a message to show the Iranian that they are actually can be penetrated, that we can reach even sensitive places like the Nataz. And this is a place where they actually enrich uranium for clear purpose. But uh, Israel tried to do it in a very, very careful way. So I think that both sides can be satisfied. And I don't um, uh, predict that there will be a real escalation after uh, this event. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, uh, let's say, the long conflict between Israel and Iran is going to be resolved. On the contrary, we have to remember that uh, what we see right now in the past two weeks is only, uh, let's say, some uh, reflection of the Iranian very clear decision, which is explicitly announced by the Supreme Leader, that the state of Israel should be eliminated from the air. They say it explicitly um, and, and, again and, and again and again. And General... Uh, so, so, General, so as far do, as Iran is think, concerned... No, uh, it is important do to... Do you think to, that uh, message... No, no, let, let me finish this sentence. You, so as far as Iran is okay, concerned, there is, no, there is no any dispute that should be resolved. This is the goal to eliminate the 8 million Jews who live in this country. And as long as they fail to achieve this goal, they will continue either by proxies or directly by Iranian forces. This is their legacy. This is the supreme goal of Iran, and they will continue. General, uh, do you think that message from Israel today was received in Iran? I earlier in the program spoke to someone in Tehran and he said they saw Iran's attack on Israel last weekend as a success, as sending their own message that, uh, frankly, this is now a different phase, that they won't tolerate, for example, their compounds being attacked or their generals being killed, that this is how they intend on responding. And should anything like that happen again, they're not hesitating to, to launch further uh, attacks. He, he said that to me in the last hour. So do you think the message that Israel was trying to send has been received? Well, I don't know. Again, both sides are trying to, uh, let's say, to emphasize their success. 
and in a way to uh, underestimate the success of the other side. But the important matter is this. In a parallel, uh, parallel to the attack in Iran, Israel did attack uh, Iranian radar in Syria. And this is much more important because the Iranians are trying to establish in Syria a similar organization to Hezbollah in Lebanon. And I just listened to the other interview that you uh, uh, that you gave uh, with the uh, let's say Hezbollah member of parliament in Lebanon. And certainly that's what the Iranians want to do in Syria. And in the past nine years, we continue to attack Iranian targets in Syria, and we will continue. Now, I don't think that Iran will respond to the Israeli attacks in Syria, as they claimed that they would do, but we will have to wait uh, and see. Uh, I don't think that there is a real escalation now between Israel and Iran. Certainly, Israel is not interested. And Iran understands that because of their attack, maybe they had some technical or tactical successes, but actually managed to create a coalition against them. And this is something that they certainly don't want to see. Uh, well, we're grateful for your thoughts, uh, retired Major General Agura Island. Uh, there, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, the general was speaking there about the coalition that was formed following Iran's attack on Israel. The U.S. is said to have only been told about Israel's attack at the last minute, despite its involvement in defending Israel last weekend. Well, earlier, former commander of U.S. Central Command, Joseph Votel, told me he hopes tensions will now begin to cool. Have a listen. I think we expected some type of response from Israel. They had a lot of options available to them. They could go very heavy against uh, strategic targets so they could do something like they chose to do, and they had some other options outside of the region. I think what uh, what Israel has had to do was consider a variety of different factors in making the decision. They clearly took the time to to make a, to make a decision and then executed it, I think, as, as we would have expected them to do. So clearly the game has changed a little bit in the in the in the Middle East, but it, uh, hopefully we are uh, the, the the current escalation cycle has has diminished a little bit. Do you think this now draws a, a line on these uh, events, and and we've sort of averted a major escalation and crisis? Well, I think that's I think that's right. Yes, I don't think either country, Iran or Israel, was interested in in a protracted conflict here. Certainly, the United States and much of the region was not interested in in that. So, I think they've seen what uh, you know. We've been to the brink here uh, on this. They've seen what how this looks. Clearly, some of the rules of the of the game have changed. But Israel, I think, is is I think keen to get back and finish the work that they have started in Gaza and, and conclude that. Certainly, getting involved in uh, in a protracted fight with with Iran didn't didn't advance their objectives in Gaza uh, further, and uh, and actually probably would have worked against it. That's a former commander of U.S. Central Command, Joseph Vettel, speaking to me a little earlier. This is a special edition of The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Do stay with us, because in the week the clandestine war between Israel and Iran came out of the shadows, we'll be discussing what it all means for global security and the Middle East. I'm Adam Parsons. I'm Sky's Europe correspondent based here in Brussels. More flares going off. A, a volley of rocks. Cobbles have been pulled up uh, out and are being used as missiles to hurl at these police. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. We have now left Italy and entered France. Nobody's asked to check our identity. Made by people who dare to challenge. Nice to see you again, Mr. Barnier. Why? I'm meeting you. Fishing does have the potential to stymie an enormous economic deal. What strikes you when you come to this glacier is not just the way in which the environment is changing, but the speed at which those changes are happening. 
It's uh, devastating, actually. We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. Welcome back to the program. Well, as we've been saying throughout the program, there's a lot that we don't know. What was Israel's target? Was this strike calculated simply to send a message? But what we do know is that a decades-long shadow war between two enemies is now being fought out in the open and caught up in the middle of millions of civilians across the region. And uh, Dom joins me here for more analysis. And, and Dom, we were ending there on those images of Gaza. We've been so focused on this rivalry, this uh, war of words, this, these strikes between um, Iran and Israel. And really, the world for the last week or so has forgotten about Gaza. Yeah, and in a sense, one chapter closes and another chapter opens, or should we say reopens. And I think we should remind ourselves where we were a month ago. A month or so ago, uh, Israeli-American relations had hit rock bottom. Jo Joe Biden was saying that he thought to Netanyahu's policy and war in Gaza, the way he was waging it, was a mistake. And there was talk of the Americans suspending arms transfers. They were so concerned about the humanitarian situation uh, in Gaza. There are those, and we have heard them, these views uh, reported on our channel today, saying that particularly in Arab countries at high levels, the belief is that because of all that, Benjamin Netanyahu chose a risky, controversial uh, strike at an embassy building uh, in Damascus that precipitated the uh, counter-strike by the Iranians that led to what happened last night. Now, the Israelis say that's conspiracy theory and others point out that, that as far as we know that strike in on the April, uh, April the 1st was planned weeks uh, ahead of time but we are back where we were we have the Americans saying to the Israelis that they are now accepting the idea of a, a push into Rafah that very populated area in the south of Gaza where so many Palestinians have gone to seek refuge can go ahead but it needs to be targeted and reports now from Egyptians and other neighbours of, of Israel say they are accepting their 
resigned to the fact that Israel is going to go into Rafah. Um, they're preparing for it. They're not happy with it, um, but they are preparing for the fact that it's going to happen. And so that is going to be a very bloody chapter, new chapter in the war in Gaza that Israel feels it has to do to go in after Hamas leaders. But I think it means that uh, the civilians, the innocent civilians in their millions, two millions or so at least in, in Rafah, are going to face a very hard time. So lots of questions, I think, on the eve of Passover week here in Israel as to what happens next, particularly in the war in Gaza. Dom, as always, thank you so much for all of your analysis there. Well, that's it from the team and me here in Jerusalem. Uh, we, of course, will be watching all of the developments in the region. But for now, good night from Jerusalem. And the news at 10 is up next.